By the path in the sky, the Milky Way. Gataha, by passing over Sushumanaya, by the Sushumna, Brahma, Brahmaloka, Patena, on the way to Shokchisha, illuminating Vidhuta being washed off Kauka dirt Ata thereafter Hari of Lord Hari Udashtat upwards Prayati does reach Chakram circle Nipa again Shashumaranam Nain Shishumara Translation before by his name is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada Translation O King, when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way by the illuminating Shishumna to reach the highest planet, Brahmaloka, he goes first to Vaishvanara, the planet of the deity of fire, wherein he becomes completely cleansed of all contaminations. And thereafter, he still goes higher to the circle of his Shishumana to relate with Lord Hari, the person of your God. The pole, the pole star of the universe and the circle thereof is called Shishumara Circle. And therein, the local resident, dental planet of the Supreme Person of your God, Shiradakshara Vishnu, is situated. Before reaching there, the mystic passes over the Milky Way to reach Brahmaloka. And while going there, he first reaches Vaishvanara Loka, where the demigod controls fire. On Vaishvanara Loka, the yogi becomes completely cleansed of all dirty sins acquired while in contact with the material world. The Milky Way is in the sky is indicated herein as the way leading to Brahmaloka, the highest planet of the universe. It's amazing, you know, when you start reading these these Vedic scriptures, you realise uh, there's a lot more going on in this universe than I didn't know about. <laughs> Actually, this whole material universe is very big. Actually, it is said that the circumference of this material universe you know, the circumference is around. Something like 150 million multiplied by a billion miles. And the radius is said to be like 5,077 light years. So, does anyone know what a light year is? It's a light year is a distance travelled by a beam of light travelling at 186 miles per second. That's pretty fast. You know, we think of speed. Actually, there's one devotee, I think, uh, <laughs> uh, Mandakini son, and he bought a very, very fast car, you know, WRX, you know, super really fastest car on the road. And he wanted to see how fast it would go, you know, coming down from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. And I think he had it up to about 250 kilometres an hour. So we were thinking, wow, that's so fast. <laughs> My God. 
Then imagine traveling at 186,000 miles per second. That's pretty fast. <laughs> so it means if you travel, if you travel for 5,077 years, that's a long time, at 186,000 miles per second, you could get from the center of the universe to the outer, outer shell, outer car. Big universe. <laughs> As it is said, the Krishna Loka, you know, Krishna Supreme Abode, is as big as that whole material universe. So sometimes we think, well, there's so many devotees, is there going to be enough room for me up there? <laughs> but there's enough room for everyone. It's a big planet. <laughs> a lot of devotees here. So here we're hearing about the yogis. How they travel. And um, You know, Bhagavad Gita speaks about the yoga system. It's just generally divided into three parts. You know, we've got Jnana Yoga, Dhyana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. So ultimately, yoga is the process of linking oneself to the Supreme Lord. So in the beginning, one may take up this eightfold yoga system, which involves, you know, yoga asanas, breath control, and, and, and toward, in order to achieve this mental equilibrium, drawing them, drawing the senses of the mind away from attachment to sense objects, and gaining release from material desires and material existence. And you know, traditionally, these yoga practitioners, they would live alone in a secluded place, perhaps in a deep, dark forest or in a mountain and they would purify themselves daily by bathing in the holy rivers of Kund and they practicing certain austerities, you know, very restricted eating and sleeping, complete celibacy, you know, not being attached to material possessions, you know, having nothing, get the clothes on your back. Thus, you know, with a subdued and controlled mind and senses, they would practice concentrating their mind on Lord Vishnu seated in the heart. And eventually, they attain the stage of yoga perfection called Samadhi, which comes after many years, even many, many lifetimes of practice, depending on one's intent. And in the professional stage, the Supreme Lord in the heart, the Super Soul, that little form of Lord Vishnu, will reveal himself to the successful yogi. He starts actually seeing the Super Soul face to face in his forearm plenary expansion of Krishna. So, you know. It's, it's amazing, uh, <laughs> in the early days, especially in Iskong, sometimes, you know, young men, they would read this Bhagavad Gita, how the yogis used to go to the Himalayas, to, to, to these sacred places, and live in seclusion, you know, in the forests or the Himalayas, and avoid distraction, you know, practice yoga and meditation, so they used to come to Prabhupada. They approached Prabhupada for advice. You know, we want to become yogis, Prabhupada. Where, where, where to go? What to do? And Prabhupada would tell them, you cannot imitate the yogis of the past. You cannot imitate them. But instead of practicing yoga in the Himalayas, you can practice yoga right here in the United States of America. And I have come here to help you. <laughs> if you're serious about yoga, take to this bhakti yoga, this Krishna consciousness. It's the topmost yoga system. It's the only way to really perfect.
big yoga in this modern age. And it's the best way for controlling the senses and the mind by engaging them in the process of devotional service. Take up this Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada said. You become a first class yogi. You become a topmost yogi, perfect yogi. You actually become to possess mystic powers to an infinite degree. <laughs> because you'll be under personal control and protection of Krishna, who is called, sometimes called Yogeshwara. And you'll achieve the highest mystic perfection, which is called Sansi, pure love for the Supreme Lord. <laughs> so these bhakti scriptures, they teach us how to bypass all these intermediate stages of yoga and come to the top rung of the yoga ladder in this very lifetime and achieve ultimate liberation from this cycle of birth and death. Go back to this. Go ahead. <laughs> so these yogis, yes, they travel up to these once they achieve their perfection in the yoga, they can gradually work their way up to the different planetary systems and finally reach Brahma Loka and there from there they can actually, by association of these very advanced purified souls, they can go back to Godhead. So um, in the Bhagavad Gita there's that verse in the sixth chapter that it says that thus the self-controlled yogi constantly engaged in yoga practice, becomes free from all material contamination, achieves the highest stage of perfect happiness in transcendental loving service of the Supreme Lord. So, we see that genuine yoga practitioners, the, the, the practitioner who sincerely follows, the, you could call it the yoga lifestyle, you know, controlling the senses and mind, living the pure spiritual life, gradually advances and he moves up the yoga ladder. First he's realizing that he's not this material body, but an eternal spirit soul, qualitatively one with the Supreme Brahman. Going beyond that realization, he realizes the Supreme Lord within the heart, the super soul. You know, when he, when he achieves perfection in yoga, the actual super soul, the Supreme Lord in his heart, reveals himself to the yogi. And the yogi can actually see that forearm form of Lord Vishnu, face to face. And he experiences complete happiness in that state. And finally, he may come to realize the original supreme form of the Supreme Lord, Krishna. And then what happens? His practice, his spiritual practice changes from meditation on Karamatma to loving devotional service of the Lord with the different, nine different processes. So, I mean, the root, if we look at that word yoga, I mean, the, word, the, the root of the word yoga and also religion actually refers to the same thing. They, they, are, they are each Heart that unite us with our spiritual essence. So the yoga is a science of cleansing the heart and experiencing the joy of living in spiritual harmony with the Supreme Lord, with nature and with all other living entities in the universe. So it begins with cultivating good character. You know, willingness to make personal sacrifices for a higher cause and also showing compassion to other living entities. So although yoga has many forms, you know, generally there's four main traditions of yoga. First we've got the karma yoga, the path of, you know, Bhagavad Gita talks about this, knowledge in action. Read about that. 
Then we have the Ashtanga and Raja Yoga, which entails practices of different asanas and meditation, breath control, and finally we have Bhakti Yoga, which focuses on developing one's pure love and devotion to the Supreme Lord. So genuine, genuine skills of yoga, they encourage their students to follow certain, you could say, ethical principles and disciplines in order to elevate one's consciousness and make rapid spiritual advancement. So one of these principles is ahimsa, non-violence, to cause no harm to any living being, you know, through one's actions, through one's words, even through one's thoughts. You know, ahimsa or non-violence principle is the prime reason why a yogi is a vegetarian. And the more we honour and respect and, and show compassion for other living entities, not just for humans, but for all living entities, the animals, the plants, the trees, the birds, the more deeply we connect with our own spiritual nature, and also the more will be protected from accruing, you know, negative karma. Because, you know, we read about that in the scriptures, you know, when you, people, to eat the meat. You know, actually, there's six people involved, I think. It's the person that, you know, the person that keeps the animals for food, the people that, you know, tra- kills the animal, the people that transports the animal, the people that sells the animal, the people that cooks it, buys it, the people that cooks it, the people that eat it, they all share this and incredible, horrible kind. You know, people that unfortunately in this world today, especially in our Western world, people have been trained to just see animals as food. You know, they don't you know, they, they have these incredible strict laws against cruelty to pets. But when that when, but they don't even think even consider these sixty billion animals every year, sixty billion who who are slaughtered because people like to taste meat. Another principle is such a Truthfulness, which teaches simplicity. You know, with a simple heart, you should speak what is true. You know, they say that truthfulness is based on the goodness of one's character. But on a deeper level, truthfulness also includes accepting that I'm not the supreme proprietor. Whatever talents I have, Whatever property, you know, property or wealth are simply gifts given to me by the Supreme Lord. And therefore I should be grateful and humbly try and use these gifts in Christian service. And everyone has different talents, different abilities, everyone has different degrees of wealth and, and if we can, we can take, we can somehow or other dovetail those in the service of the Lord. This is the perfection of life. There's another principle for the yogi is santosh, which means contentment. Contentment, inner peace, inner satisfaction. A true yogi, he aims to be self-satisfied free from lust and, and this obsession for over-accumulating material possessions. You know, the yogic way of life, the motto is uh, simple living, high thinking. <laughs> this is our motto, Krishna conscious motto. Simple living, high thinking. Because simple living doesn't necessarily mean you have to live in an impo- impoverished way. Simple living means finding a healthy balance, you know, between our everyday activities in relation to the body and mind, you know, keeping healthy, 
keeping clean, you know, keeping protected. You know, we have to find a balance between activities in relation to the body and mind and, and our spiritual practices that we perform every day. And this is Bhagavad Gita. Krishna talks about this. Stress. If you want to always feel happy and satisfied and peaceful, we have to find a balance between our everyday activities and uh, material activities in relation to the body and mind and our spiritual activities. We have to, every day we have to strategize. How can I balance my time? How can I fulfill all my duties in life? You know, looking after the body, looking after the family, working. At the same time, I've always had time for spiritual practices. You know, Srila Prabhupada, we read about that in the Prabhupada Dila. Even though Prabhupada was very busy with his pharmaceutical business when he was a Grihastha, every night he would read the Bhagavatam for two hours. So in yoga, you know, real, ha- real fulfillment and happiness is not just found on the bodily platform, not just by living in a nice house and having a nice car and eating nice food and this and that, but real fulfillment and happiness is found on a deep level. This is what we learn in Bhakti Yoga, in living the pure spiritual and godly life. With, uh, with, with integrity and appreciating these amazing gifts and opportunities given us to us by the Supreme Lord. Because another principle for the yogis, Sultan, physical and mental cleanliness, means externally we should always, external cleanliness means you know, keep clean, always clean. Clean body, clean home, clean clothes, clean car, everything revolutionary clean. Actually, Papa, he once said that, that a, a real Brahman, he can find dirt in a clean place. <laughs> so we always, you know, as that, that saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. Always remaining clean. And also we had internal cleanliness. You know, healthy mind, intelligence, consciousness, which naturally comes through purification, we receive through our spiritual practices, especially chanting this Hare Krishna mantra. You know, and um, eating pure spiritual food, living in a holy place like you go, but um, you know, studying these sacred scriptures, Regularly, always keeping the, trying to strive to keep the consciousness pure. Another yoga principle is tapas. Tapas means to to accept what is favourable for our spiritual progress, and to avoid that which is unfavourable for our spiritual practices. And this it takes some real discipline and determination. And also to take some spiritual education. You know, to understand what to do, what not to do. We see Srila Prabhupada, sometimes they say, Srila Prabhupada, he was like the perfect father. And he very humbly and very tolerant of us children, our shortcomings. And he very patiently and, 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 and tolerantly and, and tediously uh, taught us anything we need to know in life. You know, what to do, what not to do, how to live, what to eat. He taught us everything. <laughs> Just like a kind, loving father teaches his son and daughter. So the Prabhupada taught us everything we need to know for our spiritual progress in life. So to understand what to do, what not to do in life, I'm generally this education is given by the guru or his representatives. You know, therefore we must cultivate 
humility, you must be humble to be able to submissively receive good instructions. And this takes us to the next principle, the yoga principle is called Swadhyaya, which is very interesting. It, it means self-study or introspection. So just as it takes courage to take up spiritual life, it also takes courage to look within ourselves and change. And you know, looking within means to, to honestly see our own faults, see our own shortcomings, whatever they may be. It may be pride or it may be lust or envy or laziness in our spiritual practices. It may be duplicity, a tendency to fault find. It can be any one of them, a, a number of things, but in order to, that it's recommended if we really want to make genuine, rapid spiritual advancement, it's essential we look within ourselves and, and see what has to be eliminated. You now, the Bhagavad Gita tells us that due to so many lifetimes of previous material conditioning, we may even sometimes act in a way that is not true to ourselves. Therefore, through yoga practice, practicing control of the senses and the mind, following certain ethical principles and disciplines and techniques for purification of one's consciousness, what happens is one begins to develop the higher spiritual qualities. You know, qualities like purity and humility and tolerance and honesty and kindness, chastity, compassion, sharing, simplicity. You know, these possessing these beautiful spiritual qualities is is, is an important part of being oneself. <laughs> you know. I, I always remember that, but, you know, my mother, she used to always tell me, just be yourself, son, just be yourself. <laughs> but, yeah, just being yourself is not as easy as it sounds, you know, because, I mean, we've been in this material universe for millions of life, thousands and thousands of lifetimes. It was material conditioning from this life and that life and this life and that life and, you know, you know, after a while you start realizing, you know, who am I? You, you feel that, some, some people, they, especially devotees, you find them, you feel that calling within yourself to understand, in essence, you know, actually, who am I? <laughs> so these higher spiritual qualities actually are the qualities of the pure soul, which is what we are in essence. You know, we hear about the devotees in Vrindavan, these pure devotees, and they just like embodiments of all these incredible qualities because they're in their original, natural, constitutional position in their spiritual forms. And of course, finally there's Ishra Pranihar, surrender to the Supreme Lord on the path of Bhakti Yoga, where the yogi just dedicates his life completely to the will of the Supreme Lord. He puts his life completely in Krishna's hands. He has complete faith that whatever happens in my life, Krishna always has my best interest at heart. This means that we see this as the yogis. We dedicate our actions, our words, our thoughts, our abilities, our resources, whatever we have, we dedicate it to love for the pleasure of Krishna. This is the perfection of yoga. This total surrender of one's life for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord is, 
it's not just a sentimental thing, it's, it's actually a great art and a great science which is taught by the spiritual master. So this total surrender is, ultimate, is the ultimate goal of all yoga and religious practices, processes. So in order to achieve this type of perfection, it takes very strong faith and determination. You know, from the beginning of karma yoga to the end of bhakti yoga, this whole yoga ladder, it's it's a long way to self-realization. And it can take many, many, many thousands and thousands of lifetimes to gradually work one's way up the yoga ladder. And this means that all other yogas are, are actually stepping stones to bhakti. The bhakti yoga is the highest rung on the yoga ladder. A lot of yogis, they, they get to the, 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 the 30th or the 40th rung of the yoga ladder or the 50th rung and they think they've reached the top. They don't realize there's another 50 rungs to go. <laughs> So the Bhagavad Gita speaks about this yoga ladder, how one can gradually elevate oneself off the yoga ladder and finally achieve this yoga perfection, sun, city, pure love of the Supreme Lord. Now some yogis, they get a bit bewildered on, this, on, on, on their journey, their, their, their spiritual journey, and they become infatuated by these desires to get mystic power, to get fame and adoration. You know, they want to control other people, they want to control universes. They want to do this, you know, that. And, and ultimately they can achieve some kind of mystic power, you know. But when they start becoming more focused on the getting the mystic powers, and the fame and adoration that comes with those mystic powers, they lose focus of what the actual goal of the earth is. So, although it takes thousands and thousands of lifetimes to gradually move up this yoga ladder and achieve the final perfection, we learn in our bhakti yoga, our bhakti school, that if one is extremely fortunate and one meets a pure representative of the Supreme Lord in the form of a bona fide spiritual master like Sri Prabhupada, who is specifically empowered by the Supreme Lord to enlighten us, we can easily bypass all the intermediate stages of yoga on the yoga ladder and we can come to the top rung of the yoga ladder like energy, bhakti, pure devotional service in this one lifetime and go back to God. Get total liberation, ultimate liberation. It's like the example given like uh, <laughs> if you go to a big skyscraper building, you can walk up the different Staircases going up to different levels, but you can just hop in the elevator and go to the top. A lot easier. <laughs> so, you know, by the mercy, somehow or other, by the mercy of uh, Srila Prabhupada, uh, you know, sometimes I think about it, you know, I think, you know, where would I, where would we be now as to where would we be now if we didn't, if it wasn't the Prabhupada? <laughs> you know, I, I always think about this. Actually, during Mongolati, especially, I always meditate on this. Uh, you know, seeking those prayers to the spiritual master. And, you know, I remember that story in the Prabhupada Lila There was a story of one man who was an associate of Prabhupada. He's a distant, distant associate. But, you know, when Prabhupada was, before he came to America, before he even got on the boat, this man recalls, he, he's seen Prabhupada standing there on the dock waiting for the boat and uh, he just had his bag there and his suitcase, he was just chanting his rounds 
And he was just, you know, this is before anyone knew about in the West, but knew about Hare Krishna or anything, you know. Baba was just standing there on the dock, you know, just waiting for the boat to take him to America to start this Hare Krishna movement. And this man, he said, actually, when he saw Prabhupada there, he was looking very serious, actually. You know, he had a big mission to, 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 to do, you know, spread this Hare Krishna consciousness throughout the world. And, and, and this man, he said, actually, he just looked like a Roman fighter. <laughs> and you see that, just a Roman fighter, just standing there ready to take on this great mission of spreading Christian consciousness. And so, you know, it's like uh, somehow right up by the message should have felt that we've come to Christian consciousness and we have this opportunity. So, uh, we should, uh, uh, and we should realize that uh, this Christian consciousness ultimately is our most precious asset. You know, some people talk about their assets I've got this house, I've got, I've got investments, I've got money in the bank, I've got so many things. But for a devotee, the most precious asset is, is our Krishna consciousness. And, 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 and it is said, you know, even, even at, at, you know, amongst all the living entities living on the earth, how many people actually, the amount of people that have a human form of life very, very small, very few humans compared to all of the entities. And amongst all the human beings in the world, how many people have this most precious asset of Krishna consciousness? Therefore, it is highly recommended by all the Acharyas, by whatever, or by hook or by whatever, whatever adjustment we make in our life, we have to protect our Krishna consciousness, protect this most valuable asset. You know, by always following the process that Prabhupada has given us, chanting our rounds, reading the scriptures, associating with devotees. Because <coughs> we know now about the yoga, we, we know, we've been taught that Maya this very powerful, deluding material energy. She's like a very clever thief. And she's going to try and steal away this Krishna consciousness and steal away our most precious assets. And she can attack us, she can steal it away in so many ways. You know, it's like... Uh, and actually, <coughs> You we see that even though so many people come to Krishna consciousness, many people also leave Krishna consciousness. And they say, actually, the two most things which cause people to leave are lethargy and egoism. You know, uh, lethargy means you, uh, someone becomes lazy in their spiritual practices. You know, they, you know, they're chanting, they stop their chanting, they're thinking, well, well I only chant eight rounds now, but I don't feel any different. And Maya tells you, it's okay. You're okay, you still do it. You don't need to chant 16 rounds. Some people, they start breaking the principles. You know, and, and, and uh, they start becoming slack, you know, they don't come to the temple. They don't read the scriptures. You know, they start relaxing off on their spiritual practices, and uh, and then one fine day they just wake up and they're not even in devotees anymore. They're just living out there in the world like everyone else. And of course, another one is egoism. One becomes proud. One, you know, Krishna tells us here in the in the in the in the, in the Vedic scriptures that. He, he appreciates everyone's service, but he doesn't like to see one devotee thinking himself better than others. And one becomes proud and starts seeing themselves better than others, and one starts seeing faults in others, one starts criticizing others, one commits offenses. You know, it's said when you're appreciating the Vaishnava, it's 
It's like massaging Krishna's lotus feet. Krishna really he appreciates that. But when you start finding faults and criticizing the Vaishnava, especially seeing the Vaishnava, it's like getting a thorn and sticking it in Krishna's foot. It's like when you stand on a thorn, you immediately draw your foot very quickly. So Krishna he withdraws himself, he withdraws his protection, and you become very vulnerable to the attacks of the material energy. So to always remain safe and always remain uh, vigilant, uh, you know, protect our most valuable asset, our Krishna Kami, we should always remain humble and, and always uh, appreciate others, respect others, and one should always, uh, you know, be very vigilant in, in one's spiritual practices. Don't become lazy. Okay. Also, we will finish there. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to ask any questions. Jai Krishna. 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 Jai Krishna